Hello, and welcome to a brand new series produced by Norwood House Press, where we present some of the faces behind the pages of our readers' favorite titles. I'm Christine, the editorial assistant at Norwood, and today I'm here with Emily Sohn, a writer who has contributed to our iScience and Astro the Alien series. Emily, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, thanks for having me. I was thinking we could kick things off by having you introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your experiences in your chosen field. Yeah, um, so I am primarily a journalist and based in Minneapolis. I write a lot of um, articles for magazines and newspapers, mostly about science, health, and the environment. Um, and then I also write a lot of books for kids that are primarily about science topics, but um, not always. And um, and yeah, and I my work has taken me all over the world on on reporting trips to many different countries and. Um, is full of uh, a whole lot of variety about the audiences I write for and the types of subjects that I cover. That is really cool. How long have you been writing professionally? It's been about um, 20 years since I've, I started in science journalism um, and it still hasn't gotten boring yet. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to hear that. With science, there's always something new is happening. There's always something new, and um, especially when, when I write for kids, that's one of my favorite things about covering science, is I think there's this idea that science lives in textbooks and you learn the facts, but um, I, I love to communicate about how science is a process that's always changing and evolving and coming up with new um, ideas and, and new facts that, that can kind of change as we learn more. Is that what inspired you to lend your writing skills for writing for younger audiences? Um, yes and no. I, um, I actually started out um, wanting to be a scientist. I, as a kid, really loved um, animals and nature and I wanted to be a, a marine biologist or a field biologist. Um, and then kind of ended up teaching to kids after college and really enjoyed spending time with young people. And I led outdoor adventure trips um, and was trying to kind of figure out um, how to combine my love for science and writing and learning something new all the time and kids and sort of landed on this idea that I could write about science for kids. And um, it turned out that there was actually a career that let you let you do that. So that's the, the direction I went. I think for me, um, I uh, when I thought I wanted to be a scientist, I really loved being out in nature and was kind of pursuing a path of field biologist where I would maybe go some you know other places and learn about monkeys and dolphins and and study them. Um, and I found out through some field study programs that science requires a whole lot of patience and time to kind of figure out. Um, how to collect data and analyze it and, and get your results. And I'm 100% um, grateful for the scientists who do that work. I discovered that my personality um, needs more answers sooner. And so what I found was that by writing about science, I could talk to the scientists who are doing all this really important work after they had done it for years and gotten results and communicate it to people. And that's where I found I got really excited because um, I could sort of be the connector between all the hard work that they had done um, and in this world of people who might want to hear about it but wouldn't otherwise know about it without this you know communicator role who could you know talk to the scientists write about what they're doing in understandable language and then you know get that out to, to different audiences. Now that makes a lot of sense. Um, you said you start off with really liking science as a kid and later in life that kind of translated to writing. I'm curious, mm -hmm. has writing always been a passion for you or is that something you had developed later in life? You know, in retrospect, um, I don't know if it, being a passion that was necessarily the right word, but I, looking back, um, I have kind of realized that I, I did always but always, but I did write from a young age, um, kind of for my own sake. I had, like kept a diary as a kid and as a teenager. Um, and I found one recently from when I was maybe 12 and 
I had documented all of the current events of the day, which I, I didn't even remember doing, but I guess I had an interest in sort of preserving history and um, explaining. I don't know who I ever thought would read this because nobody has, it's only me, but um, <laughs> I guess I did <laughs> feel like that was an important thing to do. And then in high school, I sort of had a hobby of writing stories, writing um I would write like sort of children's stories and illustrate them and um, maybe show them to a friend or two. I never thought of it as something I would do for my job. I don't think I knew anybody who did that. I didn't know science journalists. Um, I didn't know authors that I can remember, or I just didn't, because I thought of myself as a science person, I didn't think that that was something I would or could ever do for my job. Um, so it wasn't until later when I sort of realized that I wanted to do this and that I could do this, that I kind of could look back and realize, oh, I did, I did like writing. I just hadn't, um, I hadn't thought about it as something I would do for my job. And the other thing I realized too, is that I always loved reading and magazines. And I did get um, science magazines as a kid. And, you know, even as I was thinking I would be a scientist, I would I loved just going to the newsstand and flipping through magazines. I often would pick up science magazines, um, and I just I just loved the feeling of flipping through them and reading the stories and everything about it seemed kind of magical to me. And it's funny now that I reflect on it that I, I never occurred to me. I mean, it did eventually, but for a long time it didn't. I never thought well, this is, I could do this. <laughs> I could help make this. I just thought, oh, this is something I like to do in my free time is read these and kind of revel in them. Um, so it was fun when I finally um, started writing and started writing for magazines and seeing my name and my stories that I wrote in those magazines that I'd always loved was just a really fun and magical and exciting experience for me, especially in the beginning. Was there a favorite uh, magazine or book series that you really loved as a kid that you can remember? Hmm. I used to get these um, subscription animal cards. They would come every month. I, I don't remember what company it was that did these, but every month I'd get a pack of, I don't know, 20 cards. There were these sort of laminated um cardboard cards and each one had an animal on it with some and it had some facts and there was information on the back and I had this case where I would sort of organize them alphabetically and I loved looking through those um I also got some I'm gonna date myself probably if I if I say the name of it but I, I think there was a magazine called world um I should go back and look and there was I think it may have been a National Geographic kids magazine um, those I really loved. As far as books um, go, I don't remember a ton of specific books. I do know I read The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe multiple times, and I, I that's not a science book, but I, I guess it's sort of a <laughs> science fiction book, isn't it? I just really loved that book and, and thinking about um, the ideas in it. Um, and A Wrinkle in Time, that was also a favorite of mine. Um, one thing I find that a lot of people misjudge when it comes to children's literature, whether it be fictional or educational, is that a lot of people kind of assume that it's not as composed, it's not as uh, advanced as adult, as adult genres or genres for older audiences because the ideas are simplified, because they think the ideas are simplified for children. Children don't mm. have the same capabilities of thinking on it that higher scale that you would assume with an adult. But I'm sure as a writer, you've encountered similar people who kind of, I don't want to say look down on children's literature, but certainly don't hold, might, might not hold it to the same regard as uh, literature for older audiences. Mm -hmm. I agree. I, you know, I started my career doing a lot of writing for kids. Um, I was going on these expeditions and doing educational writing and then science news started a kid's website that I wrote for um, and then I since then I've transitioned into primarily writing for adult audiences like the New York Times and National Geographic and nature and some of it's really technical um, but I think the kid writing to me really 
taught me a lot about just what you're saying, taking, you know, the, the challenge of conveying really complicated topics and ideas in very understandable terms um, and also in really sort of sensory ways that engage readers um, beyond just, you know, typing out complex ideas, which is hard, but but I think it's harder to make it engaging and make it fun and make it understandable. And that kind of skill has actually really translated into my work for adults. I mean, I think even New York Times readers will, eyes will glaze over if all you're doing is sort of repeating jargon and long, endless sentences, <laughs> you know, that that learning how to to write for kids, I mean, is the essence of of getting to the point of making sure that a leads to B leads to C and doing it in a way that pulls in um, what, you know, the uh, ideas about what you can, what you might see or smell or, or hear or imagine if you were to kind of really dive deep with your curiosity into a, a topic. So, so yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think writing for kids, you know, almost the, the, the simpler it is, the more, um, complex the process is behind the scenes to make it to distill the essence of what you're trying to say. So you'd say that's one of the biggest challenges of writing an educational book for children, um, make, taking a big cop topic and uh, condensing it to, to, you know, a small one paragraph on a page, depending on mm -hmm. the age group of the reader. Yeah, I mean, I think no matter what you're writing about, it's always harder to write less because especially if you're a curious person, there are just so many interesting things that you could say and you don't have space for that. And, you know, you have an attention span of your reader or that's the amount of um, space on a page or you have a reading level um, that you have to, to fit into and you want to, you know, help kids get excited about reading at the level that they're at so that they can progress up to, to the higher levels. And so, um, you know, to, to take what you wanna say and put it into a, um, the language that your reader will understand and then wanna keep going, yeah, is, is I think one of the biggest challenges and also one of the most satisfying kind of puzzles that that you have to solve as a writer. That actually makes me want to ask you a little bit about uh, Science News for Students, which you were one of the founding writers uh, for it. It's an award-winning online publication that publishes science, scientific news for uh, students of all ages, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, uh, what, how did that come about? Well, I have to back up a little bit to tell that story, which is that um, I had, let's see, I had gone to a graduate program in science um, communication, science writing, journalism, and then um, did a few internships. And I was writing for US News and World Report in Washington, DC, weekly news magazine. And um, I as an intern, and then I saw um, a job ad for a science writer to go to the Amazon rainforest and write um, for kids on this interactive educational expedition. This was back in 2001. So it was really early days of the technology for that kind of stuff. Um, this is gonna get to your question, I promise. <laughs> so I, I ended up applying and getting that job, which I did for a couple of years until um, we've lost our funding to do it. Um, but doing that work got me involved in writing for kids um, because we would go for a month or two at a time and send these daily reports and videos to a website that, that students and classrooms were logging into and following every day and interacting with us. Um, so when that job ended, um, I think Science News was just deciding that they wanted to start this kids website. And just because I had been doing all this writing for kids and we knew people in common, I got put in touch with them and it was a nice fit. They were looking for a writer um, to start working on that brand new site. And so um, it was kind of the perfect opportunity for me. I loved writing for kids. I had just kind of ended a, a, this gig and was looking around to, to decide what I was gonna do next. Um, and they wanted a writer who had experience writing for kids. And so from the beginning, I helped 
get that started and I would write a feature story and, and two news stories that were adapted from stories in the magazine for a kid audience every week throughout the school year. Um, that publication was originally called Science News for Kids. And I think I did that for about five years um, before kind of moving on to other things. And they have in the meantime changed their name to Science News for Students. I think journalists ultimately um, and writers are the eyes and ears of you know the 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 world the re connecting readers with things that places they may not be able to go or people they may not be able to meet um, but but can get a lot out of reading about um, you know and learning and and maybe creating their own dreams for for places they want to go or things they want to do with their lives. Um, even with publishing an online publication or with publishing a book, uh, we, mm -hmm. the, I'm sure there's different processes for both different steps. And with book publishing, you and I both know that there are a lot of steps to getting a book mm -hmm. published, especially a children's educational one. I'm curious if you have a favorite part of the book publishing process. I think for me, my favorite part is um, when there are illustrators involved because you don't get that with magazine stories. Um, there's not really a collaboration there, but I love when I've written a story and you go back and forth with your editor and publisher and everybody's happy, get to a point where everybody's happy with the story and it's the right length and it's the right reading level. And then it, it disappears. And then at some point it comes back and there's pictures on it. And I just, I love that. I love um, just seeing what the illustrator, um, what an illustrator can do or how they see a story that I've only thought about really in, in words to some extent. It just makes it come, come alive and feel real and offer more than one way to, to understand a story. You know, you get the pictures and you get the words and they all come together to make something that's even better than just one of those. And I think as a writer, I tend to think in words, even at, even when I'm trying to use words to paint pictures uh, and be visual with my writing, I still am thinking in terms of the words. And so it's always really fun to collaborate with people who think in pictures, who who tell a story. There's just so many different ways of, of telling stories. And I love seeing those come together. Another really great thing about writing for kids, actually, is that um, they will write emails and letters sometimes that are really nice and that's not always true with adult readers <laughs> you know but only hear from them when they're angry or disagree about something and kids um will will write sometimes just saying they liked it or asking a question and um, sometimes I do classroom visits and I just that's always just really fun to see that kind of enthusiasm and whether they become lifelong readers or um, read a book about turtles and decide they want to study turtles or they decide maybe they could write something to you know any of those are just really great outcomes but when you interact with your young readers um, what are some ways you do it you do the classroom visits um, when they send you fan mail through the emails or through physical letters um, do you respond back I try to write back. It's hard. Um, I get a lot of email in, so it's hard to respond to everything. Um, but you know, if someone takes the time to write a thoughtful letter, I will. I will write back. Um, if a classroom, sometimes I get questions from students who are working on research projects, and those are a little tougher because um, sometimes they want me to do their homework for them. <laughs> And answer the questions. So when I get ones like that, I'll sort of gently try to contact the teacher and say, hey, maybe we could, you know, and I, I can't respond to every single question necessarily, but we could set up a visit and do it, make this more efficient or something like that. But I do like to, you know, respond to to thoughtful emails and um and very occasionally I'll do a classroom visit or school talk. And I just love to hear the questions. Um, that kids have. They're just so there's so much great curiosity and enthusiasm for for learning and and figuring everything out. And just I, I it fills me with energy too. It didn't used to be so easy to contact 
authors. And so I think it's, you know, with email, it's, it's great that that's something kids can do and feel like they can do. And I think it's part of the learning process to understand, you know, what, what is okay to ask and what's, what's asking a lot of other people and how you do that politely. And you can write, you know, to me, honestly, the, the better written an email is, the more likely I am to respond to it, you know, so you can learn writing skills and, and politeness and manners through, through asking good email, you know, asking good questions and getting responses to them. I mean, it wasn't so easy to, before all that, you know, you think contacting authors meant writing a letter and putting it in the mail and wondering if they'd write back. So it's a lot, everything's a lot more immediate now, which is, which is great. I think if, if people feel accessible to you, then um, you can think, well, that's something I could do too. If you could travel in time, like in a wrinkle in time, mm -hmm. and if you could meet younger Emily, what's something that you would tell her that you wish you know now at the beginning of your writing journey? What's some writing advice you would impart on your younger self? Hmm. Um, that's an interesting one. Um, I think I would tell myself that this was something that I could do. Um, I hadn't considered writing as a career and that would have been nice encouragement. You know, you can think outside the box. Um, I, I wouldn't have changed studying science because I think actually it really helps writers to have other interests, um, to kind of have, yeah ideas about what they want to write about that's not just writing you know what I mean <laughs> interest in the world science history politics whatever it is that's exciting to you um and then you know I, I mean these were things I did but for you know other anyone maybe interested in writing I would just say like read 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 write 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 the more you do something the better you get at it and the more you understand it and practice always makes you better at, at really anything that you set your mind on. Is that also the advice you'd give other people looking to become a children's book author? Yeah, I think reading honestly is the number one piece of advice um, that often actually gets surprisingly overlooked. It, and reading specifically the type of writing you want to do because it just can infuse into you this is sort of you get a sense of the length and the style and the topics and and how that all works and then I think also reading widely outside of what you think you want to do is useful just as a way to understand what else is out there and maybe realize you thought you wanted to do one kind of writing but you this other kind's interesting to you too. And then, you know, write, 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 practice. Writing is hard. And I hear it a lot from kids. Um, I'm not good at writing. It's hard. And I tell them that it's still hard. It's always going to be hard. It's still hard for me <laughs> some days. You know, you have to get started and you just have to keep practicing it. And nobody ever gets the first draft perfect. And so rewriting and editing is a huge part of writing. And it always is, even for those you know, I think you, you read a book, you read Harry Potter, you read something that's hundreds of pages long and you just, there's a temptation to imagine that it just came out like that. But um, the, the, the best authors, the most successful books that, that win prizes, they, they didn't start out looking like that. They started somewhere, they got feedback, they rewrote it, they rewrote it again and again and again until it was just right. So, so the practice, the knowing that that kind of rejection and rewriting are part of that process. Um, it's hard, but then it's ultimately really rewarding when you've got a piece of, of writing that, that you created that you're really happy with um, makes it makes it worth it in the end. Emily, thank you again so much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Well, thank you so much for, for having me, and it's been really fun to talk to you. Great. To learn more about Emily's books with Norwood or to see more videos like this, please look in the description of this video and see the links in it. Um, thank you again so much for listening. Um, have a great day. Bye-bye.